Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm, I'm Richard. I work for a company called Stitched. Um, so, uh, just a bunch of content information. Um, I'm uh, from New Zealand, I'm a Kiwi. Uh, though I am actually here today from London. Um, it's a pretty good excuse to visit, visit Thailand uh, and talk to you guys about some, um, some product development. So, I'm actually a JavaScript front-end front -end engineer uh, and have been for about the last decade. Um, I'm pretty new to Python. Uh, but over the last six months, it was the right, right choice for our company um, for to solve a particular set of problems. So, um, you know, a little bit of fun. So, what um, hopefully I can uh, leave you guys with is how you can convince your company to let you use Python if you're not yet, or you may be wanting to use it in a different area of the company. Um, how you can get started with a project if the sort of strate strategy is quite unclear. Uh, I work at a little startup of five people, and that's often the case. You may have an idea, but not exactly know what the solution in the market might be. Um, additionally, how you can make some safe technical choices when faced with this sort of problem, because if you just, say, reach for the same tools every time and move quite fast, you, you might end up uh, working yourself into a corner. Um, I, along the way, found some cool stuff in Python that uh, helped me out, which might be of use to anybody here. And um, uh, we, at our company, we kind of work that if the, your work isn't in production, uh, and I'll sort of jump into what I mean by specific, specifically about production later on, uh, if it's not there, it doesn't yet really matter. Um, if no one can use it, no one can touch it, no one can give you feedback, it's not, it's not finished yet. So we start from a sort of ship, ship very early. So quick little bit of background about the company I work at. Um, this is sort of one of, our, one of our key slides we show to people. We scan a whole bunch of text information that people produce at a company. We like to call it someone's digital footprint. That's CVs, project files you work on, sometimes emails, project development tools like Jira, that sort of thing. Anything that's free text. And we do some sort of natural language processing and machine learning. Uh, the market seems to call that AI, but it's definitely not. Um, so we use a bunch of sort of off-the-shelf algorithms. We're not really producing any new, any new tech. We're not academics. We're, we like to think of ourselves as, uh, as plumbers. So if anyone knows what any of these are, uh, if not, you can, I can go over them later. Uh, generally, they're stuff from places like Google and Facebook uh, and universities. Um, we're actually, we, one, of my, uh, one of our back-end engineers wrote a paper called uh, Word Sense Disambiguation for Domain-Specific Acronyms and Homonyms. So under the hood, there's some data science stuff going on, but I'm in the front end and don't really worry that much about that. Um, so primarily, it's so you can search for people in a large organization. Uh, you find them, and then you're good to go to the, pu the pub and have a, have a beer, because you've, you've won. We unfortunately have way too much tech going on. Uh, there's a massive Java backend, JavaScript, there's some Python, there's some Elasticsearch, there's some Neo4j, a graph database, there's some Rails, there's Ruby, there's a bunch of C under the hood. There's way too much going on. So Whenever we're working on stuff, we try to reach for that set of tech rather than add new things. So this is sort of kind of what our search looks like. This is the sort of sales version. Um, I can't show the live version because it's customer data. This, these names are all, uh, all fake. Um, basically, it's a little bit like a Google search. Type some stuff in, find what people do. And as you can see, we're trying to suggest similar things. So if you're searching for maybe someone who has experience in a neural network, things like AI and various other stuff under the hood, um, so basically, it's a big search, search engine. Now, we had a lot of trouble selling this origin, in, initially. Our company's been going for a few years now. The people who use this in a large company aren't the people who are paying for it. People who are paying for it near the top of the company in the C-suite. So the problem we had, and this is the sort of undefined side of things, is how do we get them interested so they can buy our product? Uh, and that was the sort of problem I was tasked with. So the idea was use the same data and the same underlying API. There's no, we don't have any time to work on the back end for this particular project, so how do we take some new insight from that? Um, so targeting to the sort of C-suite, business analysts, upper management, those sort of people. We have actually no idea what we're building for them, just something that will convince them of the value of our underlying search product, so they'll, so they'll buy it and, and try it. The idea being that once they try it, on the long term, we can show our value. So no idea. Uh, there's going to be some sort of visualization. It's a data play, um, some sort of insight, that sort of thing. So I was tasked with getting started. Um, I was the only one with sort of resource available in a pretty small company. And um, 
our sort of sales and marketing guys wanted to better tell who they were talking to, what, what was coming down the, down the pipeline. So we had no plan, yet we needed to talk about that plan. Uh, and so just, just me, and again, I'm a, I'm a front-end developer. This is a, this is a data problem. So what happens in a, in a company, especially a startup, is uh, the marketing and sales guys start to produce some, uh, some collateral and get some sweet stock images, build some charts. That's not a real chart. Some more and some more. So there's this whole machine ahead of you deciding what you might end up building, and you've not even started yet. So this is kind of a risky project. You want to avoid these. There's no time for new endpoints in data science. It's a pretty loosely defined value proposition, other than convince them about the company's value. There's no user story for interaction. Uh, the liveness of the data is not a, is, there's no discussion there. Is it available? Um, how often does it, does it move? Do, do people change it every day, every month? Uh, is it charts, reports? Do we tell them people about trends? What, where does it sit in our, in our technology stack? Uh, and there's not really a, a deadline. It's just solve the problem. So I, I got started. Now, the first thing is, is like, what, who, else is, who else is going to be available in the company? Um, and sort of who else is going to be involved? So we're pretty design-led, so our designer is going to want to get his hands on it. Uh, our sales and marketing guys need to better tell people about it and start to show it for months and months before we need to actually use this for users and sell it. So and ideas in our company, we, we like to say they can come from anybody. So what you want to do is get as many people involved as you can so that it's not just your creativity solving the problem. Uh, and whether it's in our app or not, or some sort of export, I'm probably going to be responsible for its delivery. So I want to end up near my, near my technical specialty. So break it down. Um, try and, like, uh, for sort of a, a large problem, problem like that, try and figure out ways you can split it up. The idea being that each of those splits can be some kind of contract, and within it, you can have quite a chaotic workflow. So basically, we came up, I came up with this. It's a sort of classic export, transform, and load get the data out, put it somewhere, show it. So if I can solve each of these three problems on their own, that'll work. Uh, and I need to make kind of a safe tech choice, because if, if, uh, if I do this in, say, Ruby or Rails or JavaScript, maybe no one else in the company can help me out later. So this is now why it's about Python. Uh, our main, our main back-end tech uh, is, is Java. It's a big Neo4j database. And I'm not going to write that. I don't know how. The back-end guys who write that aren't going to write JavaScript or Ruby, which is part of, our other, part of the rest of our stack. So we needed something that we could all work on. Turns out we already had Python as our sort of glue and operations code for deploys and for CI and things like that, as well as scripting. So that'll work. The problem is, is I didn't really know Python. Uh, I'd done some Python 2 at university like eight years ago. Um, but I do want to learn it, so I had to convince everybody. And of course, you're at a startup, you're making a technical choice, you need to know that you can hire people in the future, because the whole point of a startup is to grow. Uh, Python works for that. I mean, we're, we're at the first Python in Thailand. They're all over the world, as, as people here have been describing this week, uh, this, this weekend. So that's all fine. Now, fortunately, we like to say we have small data. And it's small data if it fits on your laptop, or as ours does, on a phone, or uh, also just in Chrome's local storage. So, if you really have data of that size, and a lot of, in general, people will, it, it doesn't matter just for the sort of storage layer, just use SQL of some kind. Everybody, everybody in the market will know it. You're not going to have any trouble. We had Postgres because we used Rails and Heroku at some point, and those always go together, so solved. Uh, the schema and stuff we can figure out later. We don't quite know what the value we're, we're, def we're defining is, so you don't want to apply a model yet. Now, in terms of uh, how we're going to show this off, no one had any idea. The what and the how, like how do we deploy it? Is it every week? Are we actually going to develop some kind of consulting arrangement where we tell the company some sort of thing they should do rather than just give them the data? Uh, are, there, are there sort of business analysts going to want to use tools like Tableau or Looker or Click uh, to, to answer their own problem? Um, also, the why is kind of unknown. Like, we don't actually know which problems we're solving so much as solving our problem of, of sales. So we're going to come back to that later. Uh, so what you, what you want to do is if you're start, starting something new is ask around. Now, we already had Python in our stack. Uh, some of my colleagues know how to use it. Actually, the guy speaking next door about scraping uh, was with us at the time, and he, he was uh, he's the one who added Python to our stack. Uh, the community is amazing. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, so just ask for help, basically. 
Uh, I personally, I learn interactively. I'm not really one to go get a textbook and read all the way through it. I want something I can get my hands on, some kind of maybe guided tour or some kind of challenge, code test, those sorts of things. So the first thing I found was Python cones. Anybody here used Python cones or Ruby? So actually stolen from Ruby, you basically get this Git repo and it's like 200 failing tests and you step, step through it one by one, teaches you the syntax of the language. So with Python, it was the first time I had seen the none type. The languages I worked in didn't have that. And it's not that clear, but basically each of them are just a step, to, a step that you need to make pass. And I spent three or four hours on a train doing this, and at the end had a pretty good understanding of the Python syntax. So if you're ever getting started on something, try look for an equivalent to this. Uh, and uh, it's not that visible, but there's sort of, within it, it's quite comedic, so it's kind of fun to go along. This is about making something not pass, making a Lord of the Rings joke. So now I need some Python, I need to actually get started in some kind of environment, whether it's a text editor or something. Now, I'm kind of from the hipster t side, of, side of technology. I didn't grow up using I IDEs or Vim or Emacs. Uh, I wrote PHP in Notepad, and uh, then using TextMate encoder on a Mac, because uh, I'm, I'm a web developer. So not a whole lot of like, best practices there, but I've got a, long, a lot of experience building interactive web applications. So the interaction and the native feel, and like high res sort of support for 4K displays, font rendering, all that stuff's really important to me. Um, so of course I found Jupyter, like everybody does, and it's an amazing piece of technology. But this and the whole ability to, sh I, I, uh, the ability to show the sort of lineage of your work and stuff is amazing, and as is the interactivity. But to be honest, uh, this it, interface doesn't really work for me. Um, it's a little bit more old school, a little bit more sort of engineering side of things. Uh, you know, no disrespect at all. Uh, the, sec so the second really interesting thing I found was this tool called Interact. Uh, that's a self-contained app. Uh, it's also, they have a plugin for Atom called Hydrogen. I think it plugs into various other things too. It is actually a Jupyter Notebook under the hood. You need the kernel and stuff installed. But it's super pretty and feels a bit more like a native Mac OS app. And um, I was able to even get our web designer, our um, visual designer, to be comfortable using it. So if you're sort of in this area, um, maybe give that a try. Also, I'm quite a fan of code vomit. So sometimes, if you've got code that has an uncertain future, you just need to throw it all out on the page and skip some of the best practices. And it's good that my previous colleague, Michael, is in the other room, because uh, at our company, he was the one telling me to never do this. So you can break some of the rules. You, you know, skipping some tests, skinny models, uh, automatic documentation, you know, definitely write comments and stuff. Um, applying op, uh, sort of OO principles and modeling. Oh, sorry. Um, just, you can skip a bunch of that if you're just trying to figure out a problem space. You're, you're kind of, ex you're exploring, you're not necessarily solving yet. Um, also, you can probably skip performance considerations, although it turns out that Python and pandas is damn fast anyway, so it was fine. But, I mean, in this case, if, the, if it took all night to run this export, it didn't matter. It just meant that data would then be live at an uh, interface of a day, rather than every minute. Which, again, you don't know the problem yet, so it doesn't matter. Be super verbose, um, and write for the next person who's gonna use it, because it's probably not gonna be you. And even if it is, it might be in six months and you don't know what you're doing. So, try not to be, write that magic code, make it super iterative, really simple, use simple constructs. Um, be pretty, oh, sorry, be pretty verbose if you have to. Right, so also, you can totally skip your database at the start. Uh, I mentioned Postgres before, but I didn't need a database engine yet. All I needed was some kind of data structure. So of course, I reached for Pandas, and you've all, you all saw uh, where's this keynote, and you know, you know why, uh, why this is amazing. So I can probably just jump through this, but also you skip having migrations or a server. Um, just put your data into, into data frames and then have a play and see what, what you can do. Now, so at this point, I had a Jupyter Notebook running, a bunch of our data was getting uh, pulled out to some data frames, but there was no view, there was no charts, there was nothing like that. The CEO comes to me and goes, I've got a meeting tomorrow, and I want, I've got this piece of value I think we can show. And it's about how um, people join a company and then leave, right, uh, during, during, during their career. And if you've got a bunch of skills coming from one company or one university, and then going to another, that's the source and the destination of a set of capability. So if all your Python guys come from Thailand, and then they end up working for Facebook, knowing that is, is useful. Uh, you can maybe uh, 
offer, offer better packages than Facebook, which is insane. Uh, or you, know, you can hire a bunch more people from where they're coming from. So the CEO was all like, you got to get this done by tomorrow. Like, I don't know if this works, basically. Uh, it, it's not a requirement, but if this works, this is really helpful. So I very quickly had to do some sort of viz output. So I just reached for matplotlib, as many, many would, mostly because I literally typed into Google Python visualization. Now, the thing is, what came out was this. Um, and so these are some companies on the left. We work in financial services in London, so it's banks, heading to companies on the right. Now, for starters, the data was crap. Below that was like a long tail of about 200 companies with one person in and out. So it didn't, that, that didn't help us. But also, what I realized was it was going to be pretty difficult to make this look to the level we want. Also, our designer saw it. And um, he was not happy. So that was a, we'd, we'd figured out a pretty big risk about, the, about this project. Uh, so an important thing here is your decisions will affect other people in the company, even non, the non-technical ones. So if I grabbed this, I would have sort of bo built our designer into a corner in terms of the visuals he was able to deliver. There's going to be a pretty, pretty big UX and API learning curve to Matplotlib. Um, I'd done a lot of data visualization work on the front end, and it was a quite a different set of assumptions. So our designer looked at me like that, and this is actually me, him describing how he's going to choke me if I choose this. So I needed to make a better choice. Now, it was, so what we did is, it's actually time to review who your users are, and not just your actual users, but within your company. Who are you, who are you trying to convince to do this? So leadership, the actual, you know, the CEO, the senior management, um, he obviously had requirements literally that day. The sales and marketing guys need to better talk about this before you've built it, because if it takes a month to build, they're not going to wait to tell, to tell people about it to try and foster interest. Also, they're, they're a version of user research. The designer, um, if you give your designer ability to edit it, then you'll both be happier. So what you're really doing is building a feedback loop inside your company. Now, the, we like to think of it like this. You have an idea. You figure out how to tell people about it to see if it's useful. Then you show, show them something. Then you try and sell it. And then eventually, you've got users. Now, each step of this gets more expensive. But each step feeds back to the start. Because if your idea is wrong, or when you tell people about it, they hate it, you go back to the drawing board. As you move to the right, which is that way for you guys, um, you get a lot more information, a lot more certainty about what you're shipping. However, you get a lot more cost as well. So you need to get this, feed these feedback loops to work really well. Uh, also, if it's not in production for us, it's not working. So you want to be pretty transparent about that. Uh, try and allow sort of people to collaborate with you. And uh, even the biggest features are just one step at a time. So that's the whole continuous delivery sort of thing. So our sort of most valuable player here was Jupyter, because it lets you get started real quick, lets people see it. I can check it all in, ship it to my designer, who we convinced to use uh, Interact. And you've got sort of a feedback loop of everybody involved in the company. So we needed to do some better viz, and found this tool called Bokeh. Does anyone here heard about Bokeh? Or Bokeh, I think. So a couple of people. Um, no offense to Matplotlib, but this is way better uh, in terms of building dashboards and 2D visualizations quickly and easily, which is very important. Now, I'm a JavaScript developer, and I love D3. That's what we do. Uh, I love it a lot. And when I typed that into Google, Python and D3 and Jupyter, I got Bokeh. It's not actually D3, but it's sort of philosophically pretty much the same. Um, it allows you to export stuff. So you can export to HTML, to PDFs, to websites. So you've got a lot of options available to you. Uh, there's some interaction via IPython widgets and things like that. And uh, our designer was able to relax, which was pretty helpful. So the first day of using Bokeh, we got this sort of stuff coming up. Uh, and sort of an exploration of, help of people's experience on one axis and getting more expensive as they go up. The idea being that if a company is experienced in an area and it costs a lot, that's probably OK. So things in the up sort of along, the, uh, along that axis are good. The lower right is something that you're good at that's cheap. And the upper left is something that you're not good at that's expensive. So that was really cool. It was like one day of value. Uh, the bottom is sort of an, uh, a tree map of um, people's skill sets. And oh, so right. So we're uh, now looking at production. Um, we've used Heroku. Anyone here use Heroku? Right, OK. Um, it's owned by Salesforce these days. And basically, it gives you this. It acts as a Git uh, remote endpoint. You push to it, and your code is compiled and run and hosted, and there are a bunch of, bunch of cool stuff you can do. 
Um, this again lets you get something into production from your Git in like an hour tops. So we're doing we're doing a Python in production. Add some Flask. Uh, I presume more people know about Flask. Hopefully. Now again, we're skipping our database here. Um, uh, so we've got data frames of data. There's this thing called pickle, which basically writes it to disk, um, and then loads it back in. And all we, oh, okay, that's really dark. Basically, when our Flask server booted, it loaded about 30 meg of data from data frames as pickles. And uh, it totally worked fine. It was real slow to boot, but the pages were fast. So cool, we skipped we skip way more work. Um, so then you want to tell a story. We're trying to solve a problem here. So what's your user story? Uh, now each of our Flask, our sort of Flask routes are a bucket page, so you can click through things. So these are the skill sets of a company split into sector. This is again financial services, so there's a lot of that sort of thing going on. If you click on one of these, you get the, lo the, lo oh, no, the location of the people. Um, so, uh, and the, the coloring here is cost. So this particular company has managed to have a lot of expensive people, well, not that many people in Boston, but as a whole, that group is really expensive. Uh, they have, mo most of the people are in London, and that's not that expensive. So this, is, this was really helpful, and this again was like another day's work in Boca. This is an exploration of um, sort of stitched knows the skills of that whole, that whole thing, which is like 30,000 items. And the company, that green sector, uh, that was what we'd actually analyze they do. So uh, it was important to show to them that we, we had a large understanding of skills and automatically we'd tell them what they do. But it's pretty, it's pretty nice to look at. Now it's time to go back to our other steps and clean stuff up and actually get it into production. So. Oh, we're getting, I need to speed up a little bit, sorry. Um, so basically your data, your data frames in, in pandas become tables. Skip your migrations. If you're doing an ETL script, you just throw, you can throw, throw the database away, build the tables and populate them every time you run. Uh, and Postgres is now an API for your data. So if one of our customers just needed data, they could plug into that. Um, so we, need, we looked at BI tools for a while, things like Click, Tableau, and Looker. But a BI tool is not, it's not itself a solution. Oh, one more. Um, what you're doing then is just you're, you're giving a client, a client their data, but you're not solving any problems for them. And we're not happy with that. It's not far enough along the value curve. So uh, we sort of skipped that. It didn't work so well for us. Um, right, so now we've got our first story in terms of like our designer and our marketing guys came up with what we're going to solve. So if people are on a bench, they're a cost to your company and they're not doing anything, the bench being like, uh, consulting firm, uh, people who aren't actually working on stuff. So this is a big risk. Uh, it's a problem of prediction. You need to look into the future. Uh, it's really hard to build in the BI tools. We just needed a new table for our data. And it was a pretty small change along the whole workflow we'd built. So that worked quite well. And it proved our pattern. So in the end, JavaScript won for me. Um, we put it, in, put it into our web app. And um, we were able to keep pretty much all the work except the visualizations. Bokka became D3. We're still actually using it to prototype. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of front-end tech I can talk about if anyone's interested. We're still, um, our ETL script is still on Jupyter. Um, the, it really helped us. I was, I, I was not free. Our back-end guy was, it was, became free. He turned our Jupyter script into an ETL script without me touching it because it was super clear. So I used Jupyter. Sorry. So, what we really did was split it up into three layers. You saw that before. And at the start, everything was Python, and it was super awesome to get started and really, really, really helpful. But as we started to move further along, I added some JavaScript to the end to make it a bit prettier, a bit more interactive, a bit of a web, an actual web app. Then we added Postgres. But so we ended up here with our actual users after we shipped this, feed, this product. However, we still use Python to prototype all the way along using everything that we've built so far. So nothing got thrown away. Right, so what did we learn during this? Build something really simple because you don't know what, what uh, if you don't know the answer to the problem yet, just yeah, build something simple. Take stuff off the shelf. So Python, Jupyter, Bokeh, things like that. Code for the next human that's coming after you. So just code really simply. I'm sorry I didn't have a code example, but basically you look at it and you're like, this, is the, this person's not a good developer. If someone looks, sorry, this person's not trying to be too smart, I think is a good way to describe it. Split your stuff up, because within e if you split up your workflow, within each thing, you can kind of do what you want and be chaotic. But as long as each step works well together, has an API contract, for example, then th you can get a reliability from there. Uh, iterate early and have a production story. So 
right from the start, I was able to show stuff to our designer. We were able to have the CEO come up with an idea and get feedback that day. Able to have sales and marketing use an exported version from Bokeh. It was really powerful for us. What you're really doing is empowering your team to use the tools you're using, and you, you'll get way more done if it's not just you. Uh, it's actually totally fine if a tech is new to you, and if it's not, but if it's not new to people in your company, then that's fine, you can learn from them. The other way around is bad. If it's not new to you, but new to everybody else, you're building yourself into a corner. So if I built all this in JavaScript, I'd, only, I'd be the only person who could ever work on it. Python, however, is used by way more people, at least in our company. Uh, and I was able to end up in my domain, though. The actual visual output was JavaScript and D3 uh, and React and all sorts of goodness. So in the end, we're pretty happy. Also, if you're building something in a product environment, every feature you come up with uh, is a roadmap. So each visualization we built, each bit of tech, everything from a support point of view, you have forever until you, until you remove it. So adding stuff is quite risky. And try and add the smallest thing possible. Right, that's everything. Uh, sorry I had to speed things up there at the end. Um, but I now fortunately have a few minutes for questions, if anyone's interested. Uh, and that's how you can contact me if need be. Thanks.